Brutally honest and open, Scott Speed doesn't hold back when reflecting on his time in Formula One. How young I was and uneducated, massive ego. I didn't have the drive to keep getting better. I didn't have the drive to keep pushing myself. I just look back at a silly kid. It's kind of embarrassing, honestly. Driving for Toro Rosso, he contested 28 races over 18 months. He was quick and he was intelligent, but he didn't manage to score any world championship points. There were, of course, many reasons why his Formula One career came to a premature end, and some of it came down to his attitude. He was, in his own words, a cocky kid, but having learnt the error of his ways, Scott's now helping others avoid the same mistakes. I would have been better going back knowing what I do now, but also in that sense, I'm now doing that work in America, focusing on the driver and how they can improve and giving them the tools that, that we didn't have in our generation, or at least for us personally. So to now be spending my energy and time in that role has been really rewarding. Hello and welcome to F1 Beyond the Grid. I'm Tom Clarkson, and this week I'm speaking to someone who, with a name like his, was always destined to be a racer. Californian Scott Speed was discovered by Red Bull's US driver search program 20 years ago, after which he won some championships and catapulted up the ranks, and in 2006 was given a seat at Toro Rosso, the team now known as Alpha Tauri. Scott knew he was fast and he knew he had a lot of ability, but there's a fine line between confidence and cockiness, and the latter proved to be his downfall. A year and a half in, Scott was replaced at the team by Sebastian Vettel. When looking back at his younger self, Scott is incredibly candid and forthright. He explains in detail the ways in which his attitude ruined his chances of success in Formula One, and he paints a fascinating picture of what life was like for a young driver in the early noughties. Since returning to the US, he's competed in a wide variety of cars and even won three Summer X Games gold medals in Rallycross. He really can drive anything fast. We go right back to the start of Scott's journey in motorsport and hear how his father's passion for Formula One influenced him from an early age. We discuss why he struggled to settle in Europe and how he broke Franz Toss' patience in his last ever Grand Prix. Scott also tells me why he loves helping today's young drivers learn from his own shortcomings. He's so interesting on many levels. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Scott, it's great to have you on the show. How are you? It's been a long time. Uh, I'm great. I I'm fresh off of uh, the Miami GP, so I feel like I have a little bit of F1 in me at the moment. But, um, you know, prior to that, it it's been some time. So really cool to get to see the race this past weekend and run into old friends. It it's kind of crazy. A lot of the, the people that, <laughs> that, I that I've known in F1, they're all at different teams now. <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty crazy. <laughs> When were you last at a race? Uh, the last race I was at before the, the Miami races was my last race in Nürburgring with Toro Rosso. So European Grand Prix 2007. Hey, did you feel that the sport had changed as you walked around the Miami paddock? Honestly, not at all. Everything was so similar to how I remembered. But I mean, it's, God, it's been so long ago that, you know, I'm sure my memory isn't the greatest either. Who did you catch up with? I mean, who, which drivers were racing back then? Lewis was racing. Fernando was racing. Then obviously there were the Christian Horners and Franz Tost some people. Honestly, the coolest people I ran into were the ones ones that I was obviously the closest with when I was over there, and that was Fabian uh, at Toro Rosso and Franz. It was really great, honestly, to run into Franz, because the last time I saw him in Formula One, he was literally like strangling me. He had me by the, he had, he had me by the fire suit. And to be able to catch back up to him, obviously, as an adult now, uh, and someone with some perspective was, was super special. Um, I was glad to give him a big hug, and he's retiring now. So um, it was cool to be able to see him and also cool to see that, you know, now Red Bull is a Formula One world champion. I remember the exact day when they, they bought Jaguar. And I remember sitting in the green Jaguar at Hockenheim, actually. I adding up a picture of this. It's like 2004. So to see how much success Red Bulls have with both teams is um, it's pretty cool. 
And you still have the Red Bull connection because you're wearing the Red Bull hat as I speak to you now. I think you were with Red Bull last weekend in Miami as well. Yep, I was. As always, Red Bull does um, a really great job with their athletes and bringing people who are incredibly successful in their discipline together um, into this environment where people can get to know each other and be around people who are really special at their sport or their discipline, whether that's an influencer or a skateboarder or a skier. They attract a lot of really cool individuals. And there were some really cool individuals in Miami. I mean, the guest list is phenomenal. On the grid, it is like a tidal wave of celebrities moving from the back towards the front. It's extraordinary. It's unlike any other race, I must say. It is, certainly. I think that there's a little bit of that in NASCAR as well. But no, nothing compares to that awe factor of Formula One. And in a lot of ways, it almost distracts from the actual motor racing aspect of it, which is, you know, obviously the part that I've been in, involved in my whole life. But it is, it's a lot, you know, you, <laughs> it's, a, it's a very big event. Yeah. Well, look, you have raced anything and everything, as far as I can make out, since you retired from Formula One in 2007. How much would you like to drive one of these modern cars now? Sure, that that would be cool to do. But honestly, I think I have a pretty decent perspective of, I guess, different cars. So I, I've done that. I don't really have the itch to be in the driving seat so much these days. Like my latest ambitions are like, you know, in Rallycross, they're moving to an electric template and those cars drive very differently. And me, I'm, I'm a student of racing. Whether it's the F1 cars that I were in or the ones nowadays, they're they're still in their special class of cars because they create a lot of grip and you have to feel the limit of a tire at an incredibly high G. Um, and that's what makes that sport unique and difficult. You know, so yeah, it would be cool to just kind of see what the guys are feeling and all that, but it's still going to be in, in a box of an F1 car. It's going to have crazy amount of grip. Um, it would be cool to drive one without the traction control and all of the electronic assist that we had. You know, I feel like that's something unique that they have. Certainly racing these things look a bit more fun with the DRS. Uh, it looks more racy out there. That definitely is cool. And, and the grid is super close. So racing it would be super cool, you know, in, in this era. But um, it's still a Formula One car. You know, I think that for me and where I am in life, I, I am a student of driving and sport and I love kind of trying and to figure out what the next, you know, vehicle is and, and how to sort of master that vehicle. And the next thing on my radar is an electric rallycross car, or at least this, the thing that's going to be feasible and something that's going to be a possibility. <laughs> and Scott, given everything you've just said, do you respect someone like Fernando Alonso who went and had a go at Indy and then he had a go at Le Mans? with Toyota and he's also racing in Formula One. He has expanded away from F1, hasn't he? Yeah, certainly he has. Those are all in a pretty tight box too. You know, I think you plug any F1 driver into any of those environments and they're, you know, immediately, if not the best guy there, have the potential to be the best guy there very soon. It's a very different story to do that in, uh, let's say NASCAR or in like a rally cross or a rally situation. You know, that is something where you take the best F1 driver in the world and you plug them into those environments and they're not the best guy, not even by a long shot. But, and not to say they can't get there, but I'm just saying that that environment is a lot different, you know, with the dynamics of the cars and the racing. So when you plugged yourself into rallying with Subaru and you had someone like Travis Pastrana as your teammate who has sort of specialized in that area for much longer than you... How long did it take you to get up to speed with him? My rally cross story is kind of the unique one. I was on the grid at a NASCAR race in Bristol, Tennessee. And this man, Colin Dyan, came up to me, someone I had known from F1. He said, hey, I bought this rally cross series and we have the X Games in Brazil. Um, would you like to come as like a star guest driver? And I said, without even thinking, I was like, yeah, sure, of course. And then I went home and I watched the video and I'm like, oh gosh, these things are actually doing jumps. Wait a minute. And so my first call was actually to Travis, you know, I'd known him as a kid, you know, from the rebel days. And I'm like, Travis, what's the deal with these jumps? Like, is this difficult? He's like, yeah, I mean, the only thing you need is trend Travis side. Well, the only thing you need to really worry about is just don't hit the brakes in the air. Cause then the nose will go down and you'll land on the nose and you'll flip and it'll be really bad. And so effectively he scared the crap out of me. And so I go to Brazil and I'm watching these cars drive around this track. It's all dirt. Cars are sliding around sideways and there's this big jump there. And I, I sit out like the first practice. I'm just watching everything. 
right? And I'm, I'm watching, I'm like, okay, I'm trying to get an idea of what it's going to feel like. And I get in my car and I go out there and right before I go, they had watered the trap and this is all dirt, mind you. And so I go out there and it's super slippery and I know I'm going way slower than what I just saw. And so I did like half the practice. I didn't do the jump at all. I came in and I was like, guys, like, thanks for having me out here, but it's better we just keep the car here because I'm going to crash. Like, I don't really, I'm not having a lot of control here. And then they assured me like, no, no, you don't understand. They just wore the track. It's, it's, it's going to be better in a little bit. And I was like, okay. You know, again, like no dirt experience. And then I went out actually later and um, was really fast and I ended up qualifying. I ended up qualifying pole and winning the next game's gold medal that weekend. So my first foray into rallycross was super successful, but it turns out the type of dirt we were on was just one that really catered to my driving style. You know, I was just really good at being nice and tidy and keeping it right near the the barriers on the apexes and not getting into the fluff because it did blue grooved. So there's like this one trap where if you were on there, you had lots of grip and you had to drive the car really straight. You weren't really sideways, but this is because of the surface. So I thought, man, I got this rally cross thing down. I just whooped Travis, Ken Block, Tanner Faust, all these guys and these rally cross stars. I just smoked them like shit. No problem. And then we went to the Munich X games, which was like proper gravel, like rally, like where you have to be sideways and with all this wheel spin. And I got destroyed and realized, okay, this is a lot more complicated than I thought. And that's when I it really rally cross drew me in because it took a driving style that I did not have and, and I had to adapt to. Um, and that process is what I love about motor racing. I feel like that's in my core of who I am is, is really just a student of the sport. We'll be back with Scott in just a moment. But first, I've got good news for those of you that use digital currencies. Or perhaps you're curious but cautious about getting started, which is understandable. Because jumping into the world of digital currency can be scary. We live in a world that's more digital than ever, with nearly every want or need just to tap away. Convenience is key in this day and age, isn't it? And so many of our favorite digital services seamlessly meet the physical world when they're delivered to your front door, sometimes in a matter of hours or days. But until now, that hasn't been true for crypto. Digital currencies have been tied up online with no easy way to bring them into the real world, leaving you with less control over the cash you have on screen versus the cash you have access to in your pocket. And that's why we're so excited to share that you can now cash in and out of select digital wallets at participating MoneyGram locations without a bank credit card or debit card. Just think of the freedom that will give you and your finances as you explore your options. Convert your digital currency to cash and back again using the only digital wallets with real cash access activated by MoneyGram. Learn more at moneygram.com forward slash Stellar Wallets. That's moneygram.com slash Stellar Wallets. Let's wind the clock back now. All right, we're going to talk about your journey, your time in Formula One. When you think back to those years with Toro Rosso, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Oh gosh, how young I was and uneducated, um, massive ego. I just look back at a silly kid. It's kind of embarrassing, honestly. I obviously had a lot of ability. I was very good at driving that type of vehicle. I don't think I was at the level of like your, your Rossbergs or your Lewis. From my generation, those guys were special. Obviously, Lewis still is because he's still competing with this next generation of, of driver, which is remarkable. Um, it's really insane. But I didn't have a good why. You know, my reason for doing that was just I wanted to see how good I was. I didn't have a good mental model. I certainly didn't have a good mindset. I was put into some incredibly great environments by Red Bull to help me succeed and help me develop. Because when I left America and went over there, I didn't, ha I didn't have the ability to do it. But they did a great job of placing me with good teams up the ladder where I could learn. Even though I didn't realize I was learning, I just thought that if I was fast, it was because the car was good. And if we were slow, well, the car was crap. <laughs> you know, I had no responsibility for any of that. I honestly just thought that as a racing driver, you could either, you were either fast or you weren't, which is pretty silly. <laughs> but at the time, that was my perspective. And, you know, so for me, it was more like, well, how far can I go in motor racing? And once I kind of saw where that was, I realized, you know, I'm a pretty decent F1 driver. I can compete with these guys. And in my mind, I was like, yeah, if I change teams, I could run over here and I could run 
in this position. I'd kind of mapped it all out. And then when I realized that I was checked out, I didn't have the drive to keep getting better. I didn't have the drive to keep pushing myself, you know, without that proper motivation, it ended the way it did. I wasn't the guy that was going to take a team and, and make everything better. At what stage in your life, in your career, did all that make more sense to you? Did you realize that you actually had to work harder at it? Well, I think that the first thing that happened was I came back to America and I thought I was going to get into a cup car and just win because like I'm an F1 driver. Like, of course, I'm going to be able to do this. And I'm not kidding you. If you've seen the movie Days of Thunder, I promise you it was a million percent like I was cold trickle. I went and then literally after like a year of racing stock cars, I got into a cup car at Charlotte and I was literally the second fastest guy on the board. They had Jeff Gordon up there and on P2. I'm like, no problem. And then I got out there with like 35 other guys and was destroyed. I think I finished my first race three laps down. It took a while actually. And in this regard, it's amazing how much the ego will protect you because it took me a while for me to finally run into that wall that, well, maybe I, there's some things that I can get better at. And so at the end of the, my, my main foray in a NASCAR before Red Bull shut down their, their NASCAR team, I'd kind of figured some of that out and I started having some pretty good results. I had a couple top tens and I was getting better. And that really, for me, motivated me to be like, okay, I just love learning because that process of once I did finally realize that I could get better and put effort into that, that was a magical moment because then all of a sudden I had control. It wasn't about necessarily where my results were or how we were. It was more about, well, I'm better today than I was yesterday. And ooh, I learned this. And that growth was really rewarding. If you'd had that attitude in Formula One, do you think you could have achieved more? Uh, well, I mean achieve more what does that mean over there i mean i would be better no question achievement in formula one is so difficult because you know there's so many guys that are in formula one that don't have a formula one world championship but they're amazing so depending on your era and your timing of when you're in there or when you're not it's incredibly important and so for me personally there was a really small window where I was going to make it to Formula One because I had no, we had no money as a family. Red Bull funded everything for me. And for one, that wasn't there before I got there. And it went away soon after I got there. So like there was a, it was really a fortunate timing for me. And in this small piece of time where you could have no money, just be incredibly talented. And Red Bull had this system where they were fostering guys like, like Fettel, for example, and it was only a few years of window where that was the case. And after that, even then you needed to start bringing money. And that was never going to be a possibility for me. Would I would have been better going back knowing what I do now. But I think that's also the case for almost anybody in that, in that case. As you get older, you get wiser, you start improving. But also in that sense, I'm now doing that work now in America. I have a, a very good friend now. His name's Josh Wise. We, for the last few years, have got a driver development program here where it's focusing on the driver and how they can improve and giving them the tools that, that we didn't have in our generation, or at least for us personally. Because you think about how much money and time is spent on the cars, especially in Formula One or, or any race series, really. There's so much energy that goes into making the cars better, but there's never been, at least in my career, someone that has been there to help make the driver better. To say, hey, you can think about this differently here from a standpoint of a, a racing driver who can relate to it. There's been physios and sports psychologists and people helping, but it, it's never been in my experience, someone that has really been able to help or that I had ever been able to get really help from. So to now be spending my energy and time in that role has been really rewarding. Can I wind it back even before Red Bull's help? Because you're a California boy and, you know, Jeff Gordon was, and he went into NASCAR. Why Formula One for you? That's what my dad watched. I mean, it's simple as that. It's just the environment I grew up in. When I, as a kid, I watched my dad race a go-kart. I watched my dad be a, a national champion in a go-kart. Like from an early age, my identity was around, you know, wanting to be like my dad. Um, and my dad watched Formula One on the weekend. I mean, I did watch a little bit of NASCAR, but there was never really a question. And my dad, Michael Schumacher was his favorite driver. I wanted to be like Michael Schumacher. That's what my dad liked. Like I'm, as, as a child, like I wanted to make my dad proud. And I knew that's what he liked, even without him saying it. My, and my dad was, he was so great because he never put any pressure on me to win or perform. He just allowed me to chase my dream. 
and he was incredibly supportive of that, with that, but he's the one that laid that groundwork for me to want to do that 100%. And at what point did it get serious? Did it change from just being something you did together at the weekends to I can actually do this? Well, that changed really quickly because it was something that, and this was a bit, you know, this was good and bad, but I didn't get to drive my first go-kart until I was 10. But I'd been going to the go-kart track watching my dad since I was three. And what I didn't realize was how much I was actually learning doing that because I got my very first go-kart at 10 years old and right away I was really good at it. Like literally from the first time I sat in it. So it gave me this identity of I'm naturally talented at this. A year later, I won a national title in a go-kart. And from that moment, because all that success came so quick, I was able to get sponsored. You know, I had an engine sponsor, a go-kart sponsor, and that's the and honestly, that's the only reason why we were able to race. But what that did is that gave me this identity that I was just a naturally talented race car driver. Like I didn't practice. I didn't need anybody to tell me how to do it. And so I held on to that for so long and it became my why. Like I wanted to, to find out how good I was. And I didn't realize that I wasn't like a point on a graph that this is how good Scott is. I didn't realize that that's just how good I am now and I can get better which is kind of a shame, but I, I did eventually learn that in life. And, and it was a beautiful, like, I, I appreciate that so much now. But yeah, because I had so much success so early and realized as well so early, that's what I wanted to do. I was a competitive kid. I played sports. Like I said, the, the first time I won a national title, I realized, well, shoot, I can do this really good. This is what I want to do. I want to go to Formula One. I knew that crystal clear at the age of 11. What path did you think you had to Formula One at that point? Because this is pre-Red Bull. You go and race things like Barber Dodge, don't you? But how were you going to navigate your way into Formula One? No idea. Not not a clue. Didn't even, <laughs> honestly, didn't, didn't think about it like that either. I just knew that's where I wanted to be. I didn't really spend any energy trying to figure out what that path looked like. I just put all the energy into winning races and being as fast as I could. And really... If it wasn't for Red Bull, I'd be in college or I'd be a mechanical engineer right now because when I got through karting, you know, I finished karting here in America at the highest level. I feel like I was the best American carter or at least one of that. And I had gotten a couple opportunities to race open wheel cars because of that. I was successful doing that, but I, there was no more money left to keep going. So I went as far as I could and then I was going to college. I'd done uh, a semester at a community college nearby, and then I got the call from Danny Sullivan saying, hey, Red Bull's got this American F1 driver search. Um, you've been invited uh, you know, as one of these 16 guys to trial for this thing. I was like, are you kidding? Like, yes. If it's not for that call, and if it isn't for the people, and there's many of them that were involved in making that happen, then you know, I'm a mechanical engineer right now, not a racing driver. Did you know Danny Sullivan? prior to this nope i only knew him from tv because in our science class they were trying to explain aerodynamics by him spinning and winning in the indy 500 i, I could never correlate that you know as someone that was racing they, the way they were trying to explain i remember in class thinking like you're going out on a limb here buddy but yeah he, he made it clear what the plan was and so i started training and getting ready for uh for the red bull runoff Danny Sullivan was one of the FIA stewards at the Miami Grand Prix last weekend. And I said to him, oh, Danny, I'm, I'm going to be catching up with Scott later on. And he waxed lyrical about you, Scott. He said that at the final for that Red Bull driver search in Paul Ricard, he said, you were far and away the quickest guy there and you were incredibly impressive. So there we are. Congratulations. Oh. But perhaps you could talk us through what actually happened? So it's a Red Bull driver search across all of the US. And then how many of you ended up going to Europe to Paul Ricard to be selected to get onto the program proper? I think there was like 15 of us that actually ended up going over there. I know my good buddy, AJ Allmendinger, who was probably one of the better guys as well. He had kind of got a deal going to race IndyCar. And admittedly, the contract that Red Bull wanted us to be under was not super advantageous for us. But then again, like, the option was this Red Bull, they're going to give you the opportunity here or go to college. Like, so if you didn't have the means, it was a no brainer. And, and I think that they were super fair, honestly. But for some guys like AJ, he thought it was a better opportunity to take a, an IndyCar ride. So he didn't actually come to the runoff where we were actually racing. But there was a lot of other guys that did. 
And it was one of those things where it suited my style in the sense that I've always been a really quick learner. The first time I get into anything, I can kind of figure it out really quickly. It's just uh, a trait of mine. And we were always in different cars on kind of different tracks. And, and that suited my good traits. You get the deal. You say the contract wasn't favorable, but how long was it? Did they say, right, you're on with us for the next five years? Or was it, we'll just... I honestly don't even remember the details of it. I know everybody was talking about how absurd it was. And I was just thinking like, you guys know that they're giving you the opportunity to go to Formula One, right? Like, I, I just remember thinking I couldn't believe that people wouldn't sign anything. Like they're give like they did all of this. Like what? Like <laughs> I just remember feeling like, man, there's a lot of entitlement here from people. But regardless, I think it was a pretty long contract, maybe. But ultimately, they put together an, a very ambitious program, and their idea was just early, right? You know, you do that same idea right now, and you know, with the amount of momentum Formula One has here in America, and that thing probably goes off, and it probably ends up working. So what was it like for you moving to Europe? Where did you live? How different was it to life back home? Oh, it's incredibly different. And ultimately, that's the the major factor of where my time in Europe ends because it was too hard for me. You know, the first year I spent in England, which at least everybody spoke English, but the personalities are very different. Life there is very different. Dealing with the food. And also I had ulcerative colitis at the time too. So I had a, a, an issue with my um, digestive system, which was super difficult. I basically had, I had to walk around wearing diapers. And so it was, there was lots of challenges there, but ultimately just living in a country that's not yours under an incredibly stressful part of your life was, was a lot. It, it was w much more difficult than I think people give it credit for. You know, that said, the racing was awesome. Like you get a, all of a sudden you're racing against the best guys in the world and it's incredibly challenging. And that part was great. That was super fun. But the first year was really tough. Um, we did we did terrible. But luckily, Dr. Marco and the guys at Red Bull thought we were, were sure that I had the, the talent to do it. And they gave me another chance on a different team and a different opportunity. And I went out there and we then, like the second year over there in Europe, had real success. And I think to this point, I'm still the only American that's actually won a championship over there which I won too in 2004, um, the, the German and European championship. So like we got to a really good level. We carried that momentum into GP2 and a great, had an amazing team there with the guys at iSport, you know, that eventually then got the ride when, when Red Bull bought Minardi, uh, made us Toro Rosso. Can I just ask you a bit more about that ulcerative colitis in that, did you think that that was the end of your career? Just how serious did things get at that point? For sure, after my first year in Europe, I thought, okay, this makes sense. We're not very good because I finished in the top 10, maybe twice in F3. Historically, I thought Americans weren't as good at open wheel racing as the guys in Europe, which is true. I mean, the, the best, it is like people from a different country not being as good as Americans in stock car racing. Like you have to go and compete against the best to become the best. Um, and if you're going to do that, it's, it's European karting and European open wheel racing. It's the most competitive in the world. So if you don't get that experience there, I imagine it's really hard to to reach that level. So when I went over there and, and I was running where I was, I thought, yeah, this is about what I expected, I guess. Oh, well, like at least I gave it a shot. But I kind of answered that question, honestly. I was very surprised that I was gonna, that I got another opportunity. So when I was sick and my class was there, I didn't even go to the last races in F3. I just went home to recover. And Red Bull said, you know what? We want to give you another shot. Did came over and did some tests with some teams and was really fast and, and, and was kind of reinvigorated and thought, okay, let's give it another shot. And then everything changed. And then all of a sudden we're winning races now. And I'll never forget. I remember so specifically going to my first real test. It was in Magni Corps where I was like the, the fast guy. And there were all these, you know, the uh, Simon Paginots, um, the Roman Grosjeans, the Maldonados. I remember like when I was on top of those guys in a timesheet, I remember calling down like dad, like we're like doing it. I couldn't believe it almost. It was all, it was, it was really more of, um, I can't believe we're in this spot and it took a while to kind of be comfortable or at least understand that, okay, we're at this level now that that's great. But the big missing piece that I had was I didn't realize it was me getting better. I had convinced myself that, well, the car that I raced in F3 was just a crap car and now I'm in a good car. And that held me back a lot because all of the education and all of my improvement happened on the peripheral without me doing it with intention. 
In these years before Formula One, who was your touch point at Red Bull? Was it still Danny Sullivan or was it now Helmut Marco? No, it was, it was never Danny. I'd only, Danny was, to me, he was like the face, uh, you know, the, the presenter for the American Driver Search, but it wasn't someone that I connected with. And again, that's because I was a super cocky, arrogant kid who had no idea that there was someone that I could call and get mentorship from which, you know, Danny's an awesome guy. He would have been a great resource for me. It didn't even cross my mind to ask him a question. That's to give you an idea of the state of what we were working with. So again, when I think back to young Scott, I think of stuff like that, like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> so who was your touch point? The ultimate touch point is Marco. You know, that was always a scary call. Did you see him in Miami last weekend? Uh, no, I actually didn't. I didn't get to run into him. But he, he's great. I love Helmet. I really enjoyed Helmet because I am I kind of think the way he does. I'm like a no BS guy. I don't like opinions. I like facts. And Marco's kind of a fact guy. So I got along really well, actually, with Helmet. But yeah, between Helmet and Thomas Uberall, those were like the main guys at Red Bull that I connected with. So again, it's it's really cool to see that they're there still and they've you know achieved so much success at the highest level of motor racing. You didn't have a manager, per se. I guess it was done between you and your dad. Did Helmut become a bit like a manager to you? Uh, and if you had your time again, do you think it would have helped you to have had a bespoke Scott Speed manager, someone batting for you? I know. I mean, for one, yes, Helmut and Red Bull did kind of act like a manager for us because they were making sure we were in the right environment. They had moved me after the first year to Austria so I could be right next to the training center. They moved me to a place where uh, it was a quiet place where I was around a lot of elite athletes. You know, at the time I had no idea what was happening, but they were creating this environment around me where I was in a really great place to thrive. And there's no question that that's why I had success after. They put me with good teams. So they were pulling strings and putting me in places where I could be successful. So yes, in a way they were managing that. Whether I had a manager to negotiate with teams and all that, that wouldn't have made any difference. The thing that would have made a difference is if I had someone like what I am trying to do now is to be able to connect with the driver and to be able to relate with what that life is like. You're, you're so isolated as a racing driver within the team. You're, you're part of this big team, but really there's no one that that's there doing what you're doing. You're in such a unique area. And you have such a, a, a big responsibility. So, you know, with, without having someone that could have helped me um, with my mindset and with the way I thought about things, that, that's the only thing that would have made a difference. Is that the same the world over, the, the feeling of isolation as a racing driver, whether you're in Formula One, GP2, NASCAR, IndyCar, is it all the same? I imagine it is. It's a very unique position you're in. And, and the thing is, is most racing drivers, when they're done, a lot of them either get out of the sport or they're doing presenting. There's not a lot that have gone, you know, the way we have. So to give you a little backstory, um, when I came over to America to race NASCAR, one of the first people I ran into is one, was become one of my best friends, Josh Wise. And he was like the best sprint car driver in the country. So he did like the wing sprint cars and the dirt ripping the fence. And we both started arca racing at the same time which is kind of like the ladder system to nascar and he was also from california and when you do nascar nascar especially at the time is a pretty southern sport so in a lot of ways i had more culture shock coming to race nascar than i did moving to europe because it's a very different group of people in a very different environment and so because we we're kind of both from california we bonded easily from that and when his racing opportunities kind of ran out around six years ago he had this idea, well, like, man, who's helping us drive race cars better? That doesn't exist. There's not a school. You can go to some place where they'll train you and get you fitter, and that's great, but that's not it. And so he went back to school and started studying psychology. And he got his, he actually ended up getting his degree in psychology and has started working with a bunch of NASCAR drivers. And two years ago, when COVID happened and our rallycross racing got shut down, I started going to the go-kart track with my dad and my brother. They still have a, a national level karting team. And I remember I started helping this young kid. His name was Paul Bokus. I went to a couple race weekends and he ended up winning his first like real big national race. And the joy that I had from watching this kid find some success and to see how happy he was with that 
that was it. And I knew at that moment, just as crystal clear as I knew when I was 11 years old that I wanted to go to Formula One, that the thing I really want in life is I want to influence people. I want to be able to help people. And I have a doctorate in driving. And so a lot of my energy now is going to making me better, whether that's studying psychology or communication and making me better at being able to influence these drivers and to be able to help create environments for them where they can get better and they can succeed. And, you know, when you, when you put in that energy and that effort and it's for someone else, it's so easy to do for, for at least for me, that's been easy. I'd never been the person that really wanted Formula One because of the success or because of the trophies. For example, all of my GP2 trophies, all of my championship trophies from Europe, I, I didn't even bring them back home. They're still there, I think, in the basement in Austria and in, in, uh, in the Mornwit. Like, I, I've never done it for that. For me, it was always about I needed to prove to myself how good I was. And so for me personally, this is an easy fit for me to be able to transition to this place where I don't need to be the person that's the center of attention. I don't need to be the one winning the trophies. To be able to help someone get better, that gives me more energy. I can feel your passion just talking about it. Do you think you'll remain independent? Because there are so many young driver programs in Europe. I mean, most Formula One teams have a young driver program. Could you see yourselves helping some of these young driver programs over here? Or are you going to keep independent and in the US? Man, I, I think that I like helping humans. I'm not even going to narrow what we do to racing. I think we'll, as we grow and, and create more orbits, they're going to be in, in different sports and in totally different environments. But the clarity of purpose is what makes it so easy to get up at five in the morning and put in the hours and put in the work. You know, what was really interesting is, you know, we went to Miami F1 this weekend and got to hang around some incredibly successful Red Bull athletes, whether they're influencers or skateboarders, and you get to talk to these humans and their mindset is so similar. It's, it's not by accident. Like I can almost talk to these people and understand how they're thinking about problems and how they're thinking about energy and it's like, okay, I'm not surprised at all that you're successful in what you're doing. God, it's fascinating, isn't it? Can I take you back to 2005? You got five podiums in GP2 and there was a pole position as well. And that was a pucker field of drivers that year. You know, Nico Rosberg won, won the championship. Heike Kovalainen was there. There were a lot of people who went to achieve great things in motorsport. How good was your performance that year? Was that the moment that you really thought, I can perform on a par with these guys? Or, or what, did that happen earlier? Well, I mean, it's the moment that I realized that I wasn't quite as good as Nico. They had great stuff. Their cars were great, for sure. But like, I knew that I wasn't quite there. I guess had a picture of where I realistically stood. The thing that surprised me was I remember when I did my first test in Formula One, it was in Barcelona, the people that I tested against for that ride, I remember thinking specifically, wow, these guys are all really good. And there was a couple guys that I actually thought were better than I was. But there's something about a Formula One car, about driving at that level of grip that suited me because I will never forget coming in after my first session in the car and realizing that I was faster than all these guys and it didn't feel hard. You know, I almost felt like confused of why I was fast. But I think it's one of those things where you you can either feel the tire grip, that edge at four and a half G's, or you can't. It becomes sharper. And that suited me. And it's ultimately what won me that ride. And I remember also in 2005 that you did those FP1s for Red Bull. Was it Montreal and Indy? And in Montreal, the first one, you were faster than both David Coulthard and Christian Clean. And I remember thinking at the time, this guy's obviously got something. Yeah. I mean, like, like I said, my very undeveloped talent got me pretty far uh, in, in, the, in the open wheel space. No question. And it was a, you know, it's a, it's a super memorable journey. You know, it is interesting because for me, my achievement in open wheel car and, and driving in Formula One will always be from a motor racing perspective, easily my greatest achievement. Like that is where I was the best me. But when you leave that and you start down these other roads of stock car racing and then rally cross and you, you're having to start from a much lower position in something with you, you have a lot less experience in. That's a really 
you know, I've spent so many years doing that that I've been so humbled that sometimes, honestly, I do kind of forget that I was pretty great at that particular type of motor racing. But that being said, it all led me to a really special place in life where I feel incredibly grateful because I know really, I think what I was made to do being someone that just loves learning. I'm in such a, a natural place where I find real enjoyment. Well, what about 2006 then? Red Bull have just bought Minardi. What sort of facilities, what sort of a team were you getting that first ride in Formula One with? A uh, Formula One team is my team. <laughs> like, I remember I visited the big race shop in Milton Keynes and obviously had been to Fianza. It's so hard to explain because the level is so high, I couldn't tell the difference. You know, like I wouldn't know a good mechanic from a bad mechanic or a good aerodynamicist from a bad one. They were all at a level. And I'm someone that liked kind of helping with the car. I liked engineering the car a bit. I loved working with the engineers. Like, man, what do you think about if we soften bars and change spring rates with this? And I think it'll make the platform do this. I loved thinking that way more than I liked thinking about trying to drive better. That was a problem. So I, when I got when you get the Formula One, I was never able to even come up with a thought that my engineer had not already thought about and explained to me in a very eloquent way to make me realize that, OK, well, I'm far and away an engineer. I'm way far from there. So my only contribution can be now driving. I couldn't help with setting the car up or strategy. I could give some inputs, but really, like, you know, the level was so high. I was a, a child among men in that area. And so then the only thing that I could do was drive fast. And from someone that honestly didn't think I could get any better doing that, I ran out of the energy and motivation to do it. And I know clear as day now, that's why my career went the way it did and why I, at the first chance I had at a different opportunity that I felt like I could challenge myself, that I took it. How big a deal was it that you were an American racing in Formula One? Because it was the first time we'd, we'd had a full-time American driver since Michael Andretti 13 years earlier. I don't remember ever feeling anything about being an American. Actually, that sounds strange, but I lived in Europe. I was around all Europeans for, gosh, it had been four years to that point. I didn't feel like I was an American in some ways. I know that I acted definitely different than most. I think I was more outgoing than more people. I think maybe even more friendly than most people. But the fact that I was American doing it, to me, it, was, it wasn't really part of my identity. I, I identified more as just I'm a, a, a solid open wheel racing driver that is trying to climb this ladder the same as all these other guys. Well, and your teammate was Vit Antonio Liuzzi, a Formula 3000 champion, karting world champion. How did you two rub along together? Uh, Tony is still a great friend. Tony and Christian. You know, we were lucky. We we were like the little wolf pack from The Hangover. That was us with the three best friends. I've now got an image in <laughs> <Yes>. my head. <laughs> and that's not even that far. Like, honestly, like, it's pretty close. That about sums us up there. We, we were all really great friends. Tony was a, an amazing human. You know, the cool thing about Tony was he was a karting world champion and... I had a lot of success in America and it was cool because I got to see how much higher um, his karting IQ was than mine. You know, there's many situations where we'd go karting somewhere and I would realize how much higher that level was that he was at. What was he doing? Honestly, the, the main thing for me is, you know, his body awareness and what he was physically doing in the cart to make the cart do things were things that I never even thought of. But his level was so high in a go-kart. Um, it was cool for someone that thought they were really good at something to realize, oh, wow, there's a whole nother step that Tonio was at that was way better than where I was. Joe, you know, it's interesting that you refer to yourselves as the wolf pack because back then, Red Bull very much positioned itself as the party team, the music, the girls, all that kind of thing. I mean... <laughs> As a 22-year-old, as you were back then, was it distracting? Would it have been better for you if you'd been at a McLaren-type environment, which was a bit, you know, less extreme, if we could put it like that? Yeah, probably. Or did you have a great time and love every second of it? No, the thing is, is that my first year doing it, it didn't matter where I was. I was so locked in and focused. It didn't matter at all. I think if you have that right intention, which I did, I tried super hard. The problem was for me when I thought that I couldn't put any more energy in to affect 
the results, then it just, I, I quit on it. And then it was a great environment to be around. <laughs> then it was the best, <laughs> you know what I mean? Then, we were, then I was at the best team for what I was after. I still, this day, I've never drank a drop of alcohol. So I, I've never had a problem with really self-control. So for me, the parties and all that, the, all the distractions, they, they weren't distractions. I was locked in. There's a couple of races in 2006 I did just want to ask you about. One of them, your third race, Melbourne, Australia, you cross the line eighth. Really good job, but you're given a 25 second time penalty for, I think, overtaking under yellow flags. You then get a five grand fine for swearing at David Coulthard in the stewards hearing. <laughs> Now, what went on there? Well, effectively, there was a crash in Melbourne towards the end of the race. And to miss the crash, I went around David. He had to make a pit stop anyways. So he was never going to be a factor in where I was going to finish. And I remember he, they went and protested it. And I remember thinking like, really? I didn't affect your result at all. You, I was going to beat you either way. You had to make a pit stop. So I just, I could not understand where he, what he was getting after. And in the meeting, they were showing a video and like a yellow flag came out to like 90 degrees of where he was. And he's like, yeah, I saw that yellow and I stopped. And I was just like, he's just, he was, he was political. He was, he was a lot smarter than I was and he politicked it really well. And so I was left with an F off comment because that was the, what I was um, capable of putting out, I guess. I just remember being so confused to why this was, you know, he was, he was basically taking something away from me that wasn't going to gain him anything. And honestly, that set the tone for me for a lot of feelings of, you know, how cutthroat that world was and how, you know, for me, I can't believe something would be so important to someone. They protested the penalty. It didn't gain him anything, but it certainly, it costed us a point. I was way outmatched there cognitively. Anyways, you know, I was the younger kids. We were fast. You know, you see this all the time. I was I had that that speed, but man, I couldn't think about going fast and how to politic my way over here and make relationships over here. Like I was just focused on driving fast. <laughs> uh, and uh, and he, and they used to be up. Like he won that one. He won that one big time. <laughs> Moments like that when I look back are so great because. It is so, uh, I mean, gosh, I was just such a young, dumb kid. <laughs> <laughs> Look, the second race I wanted to ask you about was the US Grand Prix that year. I mean, you've kind of answered this already by saying you didn't really feel American at that point in your life because you were living in Europe. But was it special racing at Indianapolis? It was because my I got to see some family that week. But honestly, like I still have memories of this too. America seemed so different to me than it does now. You know, when you live in Europe for four years, you come back to America, my view and the way Indianapolis looked, and I can relate because I go there all the time now for NASCAR, it just looked different. It felt amazingly different. It almost felt like a different world because I wasn't American, really. I had not lived here. I didn't know anything that was going on in motor racing. In fact, I, I ran into Jimmy Johnson, who at that time had, I think, already won a couple cup championships on the grid and I asked him what he did. I, I was so disconnected from America. It almost felt like a foreign country to me. It didn't, it didn't feel like home. It, it felt weird. But having said that, Scott, it seemed to bring out something special in you. You put your, your best qualifying of the year so far. I think you were 13th on the grid. Okay, the race didn't last long because through no fault of your own, you got caught up in the Montoya, Riken, an accident at turn two. But it did seem to lift you somehow, I felt. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I don't remember from a performance side if where we were necessarily good or bad, but you know, I had my family there. So that was the thing that was the most different, I guess. My uncle David was there, my mom was there, my dad, we all stayed together. That and that was obviously very different to, you know, the rest of the year. And honestly, in a lot of ways, I think that's why in my second year, my I had my brother move to Austria with me, so I had someone from home to be with because like again, I think it was just this accumulation of stresses for me of being in Europe and being in a really uncomfortable place for so long that it was like a, a timer. And it's like the more time I was in Europe, it was just draining and draining and draining the energy that I was able to put into the racing. And your brother helped that situation though? Yeah, he, yeah, he basically got me through another year because I don't think I would have even got through 2007 without him there. 
because it was just it was too much. And to be fair, in a lot of ways, I didn't because I, I had to, I just checked out. I mean, two thousand and seven, I felt got off to a not a great start in that you were confirmed by the team very late. I don't know what you were being told at the time, but I remember thinking that's not great preparation if if you're a racing driver. Yeah, I don't even think I was thinking about it, honestly. If they weren't going to take me back, then I honestly don't even think I cared. <laughs> you know, I don't know what I was going to do after, but it wasn't something that I was like waiting around the phone stressed about. I do remember that. What about someone like Gerhard Berger? He was a, a part owner of the team, obviously a former racer himself. Was, was he uh, a good influence on you, a bad influence? No real influence on me, honestly, but he certainly didn't help anything. It's not like with him being there. And, and again, like maybe this is some of me. Again, you got someone that raced in Formula One. I didn't go up to this human one time and ask him a question. How ridiculous does that sound? <laughs> you know what I mean? So no, I think he reacted to it the way anybody would. I, if I was in his shoes, I'd be the same way. I had this cocky kid that's just out here doing whatever he thinks is right. He's literally not even asked me anything. I would have probably treated me the same way he did. <laughs> like, what is this kid doing? It's incredible to speak to you and, and to get your reflections on, on everything that has happened. Um, you seem to have learned, not only learned a lot, but you're now clearly applying everything you've learned into helping other people. Yeah, it's it's a great space and I have I still have lots to learn. But I tell you, the first start, time I started re reading about psychology and, and behavior and realized that I could change the way I actually act by just thinking about something differently or having an understanding of what's happening inside my brain, that was magical to me because, you know, my whole life I'd put effort into learning how to drive fast and I got pretty good at that. And now I actually am doing something that affects every interaction that I have with a human all day long. That's fun. That's fun to try to unpack, you know, why I'm thinking about things the way I am and also even learning different strategies for communicating that to people and how, how I can affect people positively or how I'm affecting people negatively. I think developing empathy towards other was something that has been really probably the, the biggest change of me along with the loss of ego. Those have been really powerful changes to be more considerate of like, well, why is that person thinking the way they are? Well, hey, you know what? They, they're thinking about that differently. I think the, the also the, the really cool thing is to understand that, that everyone's perspective on something is different. You know, five people see a car go through a corner and have five different opinions on what happened because they're seeing it from their own individual perspective. And that's beautiful. I love that part of motor racing, especially when you have drivers too, because you could have a, a couple kids and to get the most out of these kids individually... I can't tell everybody the same thing. It's almost like I know how to drive almost anything well, but I can't just tell someone how I would do it. I have to figure out how they're thinking about it and I have to really ask them the right questions for them to want to think about it differently. I can't just tell them. I can't give someone unsolicited advice. So it's such this cool game of trying to engineer the mental aspect of, of motor racing and being a kid that it, or, or even adult that's trying to perform at the highest level and in, in currently motor racing, but hopefully eventually in any sport, um, it's so cool to try to figure out how to touch and move that. Spiker flies off the racetrack. Adrian Sotil is that Hamilton. It is Hamilton. Lewis Hamilton on lap three has gone off. They're aquaplaning now. There's so much water. The intermediates. Here comes another one. And this is going to get nasty. They're going to have to put the safety car out. What they're doing now is just aquaplaning off the racetrack. The intermediates will not clear sufficient amounts of water. And the rest of them are all deep in the gravel trap. And there'll be more in there yet unless they slow down. But it's crawling pace you need. Otherwise, you're in a canoe you're not in a formula one car scott there's just one more formula one thing i wanted to ask you about we touched on it right at the beginning the european grand prix nurburgring 2007 completely chaotic race it was raining everyone was spinning out marcus winkelhot was leading the race at one point i remember in the spiker what are your memories of what happened after the race i mean it was your last race in formula one when were you told that it was your last race? You know, that obviously it got heated with friends. Just what can you tell us about what happened? What a great last race, honestly. So our car 
as was proven by Fettel later in the year, was extremely good in the wet. I remember in practice in Monaco for free practice one, I was P1 on the board at some point in the rain. Our car, it just, for whatever reason, it was really fast in the rain. And so when it started raining, I was like, all right, this is going to be great for us. We started like really far back on the grid. We're like 18th and 19th. I think I came to the pits like 11th. I'd passed like seven cars on my way, but they had the wrong tires in the pit box. And so when they changed my tires, they had to, they put Tonio's on, then they had to take Tonio's off. And it basically cost us all like a ton of time. The race was over really from that point. Next lap coming down the front straight away, there's so much water had come down. And you guys know, that's a really downhill corner. When I went to the brakes, it's hydroplaned. They didn't even come close to me. I went by the apex going like 150 miles an hour. <laughs> like there's no way I'm making it. It's like crashing the wall. And, and as you saw, like all these cars, Lewis crashed there. I think Button was in the wall there. Everybody started crashing there. I just remember thinking like that was super fun. Like I know we didn't get a result, but like I passed a lot of cars. I mean, you know, I remember passing Ralph Schumacher like on the outside and one of these corners in the way. And it was just, it was so cool to feel like I had a fast car and I was making moves, you know, and it was just, I had, I had such a great experience and I came in and, and France was super pissed. I was just too happy about what happened. And he, he had asked like, what happened in turn one? And I said, well, the same thing that happened to everybody else down there, a hydroplane off the track. Like, what do you mean? What happened? There's seven cars sitting out there. Um, and he says, no, not everybody, just the wankers. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I think I told him to F off. And I just walked around and totally dismissed him. And he came and he came chasing after me and uh, he let me know how displeased he was. And to be fair, like I probably would have acted the same way. Like I obviously showed him like zero respect, <laughs> you know? Um, I was just this young, cocky, arrogant kid. And I finally found the limit of France's patience. <laughs> is what I like to think now. You know, I finally broke him. But that was after like a long period of dealing with that, you know, from me. Um, I think I was at home, maybe waiting to go to like the next race. And they called and said, no, they're going to put Fettel in the car. I was like, sweet. I thought, awesome. Because at that time, Fettel was like the golden child. I'm like, great. Let's see him get in that thing and see what he does. And so I remember watching by the computer as they're at the Hungaro ring. And sure enough, Fettel qualifies 19th. I don't remember where he raced, but it wasn't it wasn't amazing at all. And then and then then I knew for sure. I was like, okay, great. I can pack my, I can go wherever I want. I know that I'm elite. I know I'm one of the best, you know, to race an Opel Wheel car in the world. And if I, maybe I'm not the best, but like for me, I was so far beyond what I thought as a kid that I would ever achieve. I was super happy. And then came the opportunities, you know, the meetings with um, Williams and other opportunities to race other stuff. But ultimately, when I met with Didi Mataschitz soon after, he basically gave me carte blanche to like, look, um, obviously the car is not very good. Where do you want to go? Like, I can't give you the F1 seat now, but if you want to be a reserve driver at the big team, we can do that. Or like, what do you want to do? And I said, man, I want to go home. Like, can we race NASCAR? And he was like fully supportive. And he's like, yes, definitely. Take your stuff, go back home, meet with Gunther Steiner, come up with a plan and go race NASCAR. And I said, yes, thank you. <laughs> and I started a, a really humbling journey and the, the dissolution of the sky's beat ego began uh, at that moment. <laughs> you obviously had a, an amazing relationship with Diddy Mataschitz. Yeah, and I think I had a great relationship with everybody. And if one thing, I certainly understood always what Red Bull did for me. And to this day, I'll be a supporter of that brand because I know very clearly, very clearly that if not for that brand, Red Bull, I'm not racing cars. No question in my mind. I had no ability to go find sponsorship. I was a super shy kid. I couldn't go talk to team owners. I couldn't sell myself at all. That felt really awkward to try to convince someone that I could drive a car fast. So I was going to school like that, that ship had sailed, racing had sailed. If it wasn't for Red Bull, no question. I'm not racing cars. So I knew, um, regardless if that situation in F1 didn't work out, I still owe my whole racing career to Red Bull. So even without those 28 races in Formula One, none of the, the rest of it would have happened. Um, well, I think without their support, I wouldn't continued on. You know, I do think that, you know, without even making it to Formula One, I had actually, when I was racing in Renault, gone back to America and done an IndyCar test. 
with Shiva Racing against their current IndyCar drivers, and that was pretty easy. I, I think I was a lot faster than this current guys, and I remember they were trying to get Red Bull to get me to go to IndyCar. They're like, oh my gosh, like we need this kid over here. Because like when you grow up in that environment of racing with those guys in Europe, you develop better. I mean, you have to be there if you're going to be an open-wheel guy. And so when you come and you go from there to IndyCar, that's an easy transition. What is the coolest thing you've done since F1 in a car? Oh, X Games gold medals. For sure. I actually, ha hold on, I have those. I had the only trophy that I have. Because as a kid, like I grew up watching Bucky Lassick and Tony Hawk and all these X Games guys. I have three X Games gold medals. That's easily the coolest stuff I have. Rallycross is not F1, right? It's not this level, but it's super cool. And I got some pretty cool hardware. I was just saying to you earlier before we started recording that I'd watched you slaying the dragon. What is it? It's 318 turns over 11 miles of the most dangerous road in the US, or that's what it calls itself. I thought you might have said that, but of course, the X Games has been fantastic, hasn't it? That was the scariest thing I've ever done. Driving a, a 600 horsepower rallycross car on an open road with no rules, and they're saying, go as fast as you can. You need to break the record. Okay. Um, that was the scariest thing, uh, you know, cause I don't think I'm a very brave race car driver. Um, and that took every ounce of bravery I had, but it was super cool. They, we got nominated for a sports Emmy for that video. And have a look on YouTube if you, if you want to see some pretty scary stuff. Well, Scott, thank you so much for your time. It's been wonderful to see you, to chat it all through. What an amazing career you've had both in F1 and, and afterwards as well. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. It's great chatting with you. It's great bringing up uh, awesome memories. And there are some awesome memories, aren't there? Scott's time in Formula One was short, but he left a big impression on those he worked with and those he spoke to in the media. It was fascinating to hear him reflect on his time in Europe with the benefit of time and some perspective. Scott's clearly a bright guy and he's straight talking. I don't like opinions, I like facts is a quote that really sums him up. And I'm sure he could have achieved a lot more in Formula One if he'd raced with his current mindset rather than what we actually saw 16 years ago. Scott, many thanks for your time. It was great to catch up and good luck with everything you're doing now. I'm sure there are lots of young drivers who are going to benefit from your wisdom. Now, as ever, please send in your thoughts and stories about Scott. What do you remember of his time in Formula One? How quick do you think he was? Have you seen him race in Rallycross? Let me know through all the usual means and I'll read out some of your messages at the end of next week's show. You can reach me at Tom Clarkson F1 on Twitter or you can use the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid. Which brings me on to what you sent in about Mario Tyson after last week's show. I loved hearing from Mario again, and it seems that there are a lot of BMW F1 fans out there. Let's start with this from Jeff McCullough. It was amazing to hear Mario talk about BMW's plans to race, then exit Formula One. Whether they won or lost, as a student of marketing, it was simply fascinating. Well, yes, Jeff, it was fascinating. And it makes me wonder if there have been conversations in the corridors of power in Munich about BM returning to Formula One in the near future. Next, let's hear this from Dominik Zelinski. Great episode, Tom. Having a Polish background, it's great to hear stories about Robert Kubica. His win in Montreal wasn't just a great day for BMW, but for Poles across the whole world. Well, it was a great day for all Formula One fans, Dominic. A very happy day, particularly, of course, if you were a Kubica fan. And what about this from DB? I met Mario Tyson and his wife at the Cathedral in Milan the week before the Monza Grand Prix in 2008. We traveled from Australia and he was really engaging and lovely. We will never forget it because I proposed the very next week to my wife in Switzerland. Well, please tell us, DB, that you proposed to your now wife in Hinville, home of BMW Sauber back then. And thanks for the message. Great to hear from you. Finally, what about this from Peter Ivankovic? I simply love these podcasts reflecting on the early 2000s. Suddenly, I understand many things from my childhood. So a big puzzle is slowly being assembled in my mind with every new Beyond the Grid episode. Oh, Peter, that's a lovely message. Thank you. And I'm very glad that you enjoy the shows. 
Well, we'll leave it there for messages this week. Thank you to everyone who wrote in. And rest assured, we read all of your messages, even if I don't have time to read them out on the show. Before I go, let me quickly tell you about our F1 Nation preview to the Emilia-Romagna Grand Prix with Natalie Pinkham, Damon Hill and myself. It's out now. And you can also listen to the latest episode of Formula Y, which asks why Formula One drivers need to be so fit. Just search for F1 Nation and Formula Y on your podcast app. Well, that's it for now. I'll, of course, be back with another great guest from the world of Formula One next week. But thank you for listening and have a good week. F1 Beyond the Grid is produced by Formula One and Audio Boom Studios. Until next time, keep it flat out.